Welcome to our video worship for the 19th of July. Um, I want to explain that um, the videos will be arriving a little later on the Sunday because of recording the sermon at the actual service that we opened uh, this morning. Um, if you are able to come to join us for worship, we'd be glad to see you there. If not, uh, these services by video will continue for a little while at least. There won't be an evening service at the church, and in fact there won't be any organisations opening. They don't normally until September anyway, and we don't envisage opening any until then. But we look forward to meeting you if you can come on Sunday, and uh, we can worship together through the video. And uh, I'll be preaching the same sermon, whether it's on the video or at church. Let's turn now to our worship of God. Jesus said, Everyone that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the security that we have with you in Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for all that you have done for us, and for your tremendous mercy towards us. For we know our sinfulness, and we know our sins against you and against others. We know how we have broken off from you and how we have been so selfish in our plans and in our thoughts. Lord, forgive us for all our sins. Forgive them in Jesus' name and for his sake and because of his great work. We thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that is in him and the mercy and the grace that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that you are always present with us in life. And we ask you now for the grace to understand and to live by what we learn from your word today. In Jesus' name and to his glory we pray. Amen. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him 
because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. He came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they travelled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Amen. I have to tell you what I found over the last while is that it's much, much harder speaking to a camera than speaking to all of you. Um, For one thing, I can tell when you're yawning and I I can't tell when the camera is. So um, there's all kind of guides and just looking across the congregation, which is really useful. So it's lovely uh, to be back and to be preaching. We're reading, uh, as I said there, from Acts 15. And we're looking at the continuing story. And what we see here um, is Paul and Barnabas in Antioch. They have returned there from Jerusalem. They have carried with them uh, the wonderful uh, news from Jerusalem that there is no need for circumcision. You don't have to become a Jew before you become a Christian. In fact, they are telling folk that it is by the grace that is in Jesus Christ that we are saved and only by his grace What a wonderful message to reaffirm to everyone. And it really was a tremendous statement and understanding of the church to realize that, you know, for for people who have been brought up as Jews, for them to come to realize and understand that what Christ had done upon the cross was deeper and more significant than all the law of Moses. That was a big deal to understand that Christ's sacrifice on the cross fulfilled all the law of Moses and made the one sacrifice that mattered and that Jesus Christ in giving his life took away all our sin and guilt and places us in a right relationship with God just by grace through faith trusting in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful message they had brought back to Antioch. And now Paul thinks, wouldn't it be great to go back uh, to all the churches across Cyprus and all the way up uh, to Lydda and so on that they did on their first missionary journey to return to those churches, to strengthen them and encourage them, partly also to take this message from Jerusalem, uh, from the apostles right throughout the church that they had been involved in setting up. And so he uh, wants to uh, go with Barnabas again. Um, But Barnabas wants to take John Mark, and John Mark had left them on the first missionary journey, and Paul doesn't want to trust him again, basically. Um, He either thinks that John Mark is not quite ready yet for this, um, or at least that this is a serious thing. Remember, Paul nearly lost his life on the first missionary journey. He was stoned into unconsciousness. Uh, by the people of Lydda. And so this missionary thing was not some slight thing. It it required a toughness, both mentally and physically. And perhaps um, Paul didn't feel that John Mark had that or had that yet. Barnabas uh, was related to John Mark and saw in him what perhaps Barnabas uh, Barnabas had seen in Paul. Uh, that here was a young evangelist, here was someone graced by the Holy Spirit and the work of God, and he wanted to bring him along to encourage him. That was where Barnabas got his name, the encourager. And he wants to encourage John Mark and build him up and strengthen him. Paul, no, he's not there yet, but, but he will be if we lead him and if we uh, help him. Who was right and who was wrong? So sharply do they dispute and are unable to agree 
uh, that they actually split up. And Paul takes uh, Silas and Barnabas takes John Mark and they head off in coordinated but different directions. A division between fellow Christians and even fellow missionaries. How are we to read it and think about differences? I remember sitting in First and Bow and uh, having a discussion and listening to a discussion between the minister and the elders and uh, another gentleman, and, and they were disagreeing on points of the Bible. And I, I sat there for a minute, it was a young man listening, and, and Jim, uh, the minister, turned to me and he said, Eddie, what do you think? And uh, not, not wanting to put myself forward in front of these uh, uh, elder men, I said, um, Christians can disagree. And Jim looked at me and they all laughed and he said, yes, Christians can disagree. What do we do when Christians disagree? I want to read something which I think puts this so well. It comes from a commentary, a critical and explanatory commentary in the whole Bible. This is Jameson, Fawcett and Brown. And they put this so well. It is older English, but um, I think there is much to listen to. So listen to this. How watchful does all this teach Christians, and especially Christian ministers and missionaries, to be against giving way to rash judgment and hot temper towards each other, especially where on both sides the glory of Christ is the ground of the difference? How possible is it that in such cases both parties on the question at issue may be more or less right. How difficult is it even for the most faithful and devoted servants of Christ, differing as they do in their natural temperament, even under the commanding influence of God's grace. How difficult to see even important questions precisely in the same light. And if with every disposition to yield what is unimportant, they still feel it a duty to stand to his own point. How careful should they be to do it lovingly, each pursuing his own course without disparagement of his Christian brother. And how affectingly does the Lord overrule such difference of judgment and such manifestations of human weakness by making them turn out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel? as in this case is eminently seen in the two missionary parties instead of one, not traveling over the same ground and carrying their dispute over all the regions of their former labors, but dividing the field between them. In other words, if Christians approach disagreement, even if they cannot find agreement, if they approach disagreement in the grace of Christ, and continue in love to find some way through together, then God can overrule in his grace to work things better than either intends. Who was right and who was wrong? They were both right. Maybe they were both wrong. Human wisdom does not match God's. They were both right about John Mark. He wasn't ready. And yet he was going to be. John Mark is the man to whom we owe Mark's gospel. Traveling with Barnabas, they now step out of the book of Acts. Traveling with Barnabas, he met up with Peter. And much of what he writes in his gospel is the sermons of Peter. And later, of course, we see in Paul's letters that he continued with great respect and love towards Barnabas, whom he writes of, speaking of himself and Barnabas as examples. And of John Mark, he writes again and again and again to commend him, to ask for him, to be sent to him, to help him. Barnabas was right about John Mark. So was Paul. But when John Mark was ready, he would work with Paul. 
Christians in our disagreements, remember that our wisdom is not God's. Secondly, I think there is something here of the desire to return to the blessings and the glories of the past. How great, how excited Paul must be when he goes to Barnabas and he says, wouldn't it be great, Barnabas, if we travel across Cyprus and we go again to all these churches and we now have this wonderful news from Jerusalem to all those places, to those places where Christian after Christian after Christian came to the Lord and and trust in him and to encourage them. And uh, it'll be you and me, Barnabas, We'll, we'll relive, as it were, the blessings that God showed, even in the midst of hardship and we'll work again together. But there is no return to the blessings of the past. There is no return to the blessings of the past. They were given for them. Remember them. Be grateful for them. But in Christ, Christ is always leading us on. We are followers of the Lord who leads on. And God is always leading on to new blessings always leading on to new blessings. Remember this, for, for there's, a, there's a biblical reason why I'm saying this. Here we have no continuing city. No glory to go back to. They'd all disappear. The Lord's leading us on, and he leads us on personally in our own lives. His intention, as I read at the very start of the service, his intention is to take us to glory. They will have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. We are going on, not back. Here we have no continuing city, but are preparing for the return of our King. And when our journey is done, we will be with him. Don't try to return to the glories of the past. We can't build the kingdom that way. Let the Lord lead on. He has new blessings, and they're that way. Let go what's gone. He gave you blessings in the past, but his next blessings are ahead. Thirdly, I want to say past failure does not mean future failure. In fact, it can mean just the opposite. John Mark's path leads on to the writing of the gospel, as I said, and to further work with Paul. In fact, in Colossians and 2 Timothy and Philemon, Paul writes of Mark as a faithful and helpful fellow servant. And the apostle Peter writes of Mark, the apostle Peter writes of Mark, calling him my son. Past failure does not mean future failure. Mark did leave them on their first missionary journey. Whatever his purpose or his reason, whether he simply wanted to go back to see that his mother was all right or or whatever it was, whether he simply found it too difficult and too strenuous. Past failure in Christ is forgiven. Peter who called John Mark his son, failed Jesus Christ at the last gasp. But that didn't mean future failure. Our past failures, Christian brothers and sisters, does not mean that the Lord doesn't have blessing ahead. And he has things to lead you on to. We also meet in this passage, Timothy, who was mentioned before, He lived in the place where they tried to stone Paul to death. But returning to there, Paul meets Timothy again. Uh, Timothy became a Christian either through Paul and Barnabas' ministry or perhaps through his mother and grandmother of whom is written later. But Timothy is a young man who has come to Christian faith And as he goes off with Paul, uh, he and Paul will work together. They will find each other soulmates in many ways. And what Barnabas was going to do for John Mark, Paul does for Timothy, encouraging and leading him into mission in a way that then leads Timothy to become a leader of the Christian church in his own right. 
But there is a striking thing here. They are carrying the message from the church in Jerusalem and the apostles. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. There is no need for circumcision. That was the actual thing that caused the debate in the first place. There is no need for circumcision because that doesn't help with salvation. And only trusting in Jesus Christ saves you. But Paul circumcises Timothy. Timothy had a Jewish mother, which under Jewish understanding means he was a Jew, an inheritor uh, of the Jewish covenant. But his father was Greek, and for some reason Timothy had never been circumcised, um, probably because his father was a Greek. But his mother became a Christian. She understood salvation in Christ by grace. And Timothy himself became a Christian and understood salvation in, uh, by grace through faith in Christ alone. And yet, and yet, he is circumcised by Paul. Why? Because it says, Everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Everyone basically in the area knew that he had never been circumcised. And as we said last time when I was talking about this, the reason why the rules that were given were given from the Jerusalem church regarding not sacrificing food uh, or not eating food sacrificed to idols and so on was because they didn't want to put people off the gospel message. And as Timothy traveled with Paul as a young Jewish man, he was traveling as that. And so he was circumcised. And here is Paul's lesson of freedom that he later teaches in his letters regarding Titus, for he says Titus is not to be circumcised. He says no one can use this freedom or grace for anything. No one can say you have to be circumcised, that's wrong. No one can say you mustn't be, that's wrong. You are saved by grace in Christ alone, and only that, circumcised or not circumcised, means nothing. Grace alone. And so Titus, who was not circumcised, and Timothy, who was, stand as testimony to the fact that the only thing that matters is that God reached out to save you through his Son. Nothing else matters at all. Let no one take your freedom in your grace. And in that grace, past failure does not mean future failure. And disagreements are not the end of the story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us always to remember that the failures of the past are not the end of the story with you. For in Christ Jesus we have the forgiveness of our sins. In him and in his great work as our Saviour, we are saved by your grace towards us, in which your Son, taking upon himself our guilt, has paid for all our sin. We bless and thank you for it, Lord, and we ask that you would drive it deep into our hearts and our minds, that we might show the same grace to others and have a love for our brothers even in disagreement, to the glory of your name. Amen.